and welcome. As I asked for your support some time ago, I honestly didn't expect such an overwhelming reaction. I knew that the one or another likes what I'm doing, but to my surprise it ended up in many donations and Patreon subscriptions. And also a lot of people even contacted me and asked if I would like to have some hardware too. Well, sure, as I told, to repair retro hardware I need well, hardware which I can repair, and also replacement parts which I also can often obtain from scrap. That's why I was glad about that offers and accepted some of the donations. At this point I would really thank all the donators, doesn't matter if money or hardware, this all helps me a lot to keep this channel running. And since I got multiple packages, I guess that every now and then I will make some kind of unpacking videos in the future. And today's package is from Andreas from Germany. Let's take a look inside. Okay, and first of all, a box full of different IC sockets. That is absolutely awesome and very useful for me, since I always need such sockets when, for example, repairing mainboards which were damaged by a leaky battery. This package seems to have all kinds of sockets between DIP6 and DIP40. Very nice and in time, since I just wanted to reorder some new sockets. Oh, and I already know what is in the next one. Andreas wrote me an email with a content before. This is something very rare, an EI VGA card from ATI. But let me switch the camera, I guess it's better to see everything from the top. So, an ATI graphics card. As you see, it has this EI edge connector, which was not very common back in the days. And so, such cards are quite hard to find today. Also, main boards are quite rare, but coincidentally, I have one at hand, which I repaired a long time ago, and I have another S3 EI as a graphics card, so this ATI will hopefully give us a good competition for a benchmark. How much memory does it actually have? Um, 4 to 56 ICs, each one 128k, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and another 8. So we have here 16 times 128k, which is 2 megabytes of video memory in total. It is also a fast VRAM as far as you can see, a very nice exemplar. I am very glad about it and it will make a great topic for a video. Thank you very much. So the next one is a 100 megabit Realtek network adapter. They were very common back then and I have quite a lot of them, but it is always nice to have one at hand. Well, an Intel boxed cooler. As far as I know, this was used with all kinds of Intel CPUs, starting with the Socket 775. Next one is a multi-IO controller with a floppy and IDE support. Andreas told me that this one is probably faulty and it doesn't read from the floppy drives, but otherwise it should be okay. It is a Goldstar Prime 2, a quite common model, I will have to check it, but it's better to have one than to need one. Another nice piece of hardware, the famous 3D FX Voodoo 2, a Diamond Monster 2 to be precise. This one has also memory ICs on the back, so it has to be a 12 MB version. However, unfortunately, as far as I know, this card is faulty as well. It gets detected by the system, but it doesn't initialize the 3D mode as far as I know. So maybe... This is also going to be a repair video one day as well. I don't see any physical defects at this card at the first glance, but I'll have to take a closer look at it later. Okay, next is obviously a mainboard. What do we have here? Some kind of letter. That seems to be a recipe for Japanese rice salad for four to six persons. Uh, I guess that the important information is on the other side. Ah, I see. There was already some repair made on this board, and this seems to be some notes about that. Okay, let's take a brief look at the board. Um, there is a CPU just lying on the socket. Ah yes, uh, there is a broken off pin. Andreas told me that this 486 processor is uh, uh, completely dead. That's really a shame, a DX50. It would be nice to have it, but well, at least it will look good in a collection. Now to the board itself. And wow, this one is really exciting. 
It is obviously a 486 mainboard without a voltage regulator, so it can support only 5V CPUs. But the really exciting feature are those two EISA slots at the end of the board. We already have seen the Accordant ADI graphics card. It would be nice to see it working in this board. And above the EISA slots there are also common 4 16-bit and 1 8-bit ISA slots. What else? It has 256k of level 2 cache on board. And on the back there is some evidence of rework. Some jumper wires and repair traces. This board was probably damaged by a leaky battery. That is a shame. And uh, there was an attempt to repair it. Well, Andreas told me that it seems to be dead. And I will have to take a closer look at it. It is, however, more complicated to repair a board if someone else already tried before. But I will definitely come back to it, since it is such a great and rare mainboard. I'd be very glad to have it working in my stash. Oh, and the next part is also very interesting. This one gave actually the initial impulse to this whole donation. It is a Spear V7 Mercury VLB graphics card. It is based on S3 928 chip and is equipped with 2 MB of VRAM. It is actually a very fast graphics card, however Andreas told me that it has a very strange behavior. The card runs only black and white in DOS, but in Windows it is perfectly in color. The suspect was the BIOS so far since this card came from some kind of OEM machine by Siemens, so maybe it's the BIOS indeed. But I'm very curious about that behavior and would love to check out what's going on. Okay, the next one is a Soccer 370 mainboard. It is a Biostar M6 VCF and Andreas sent me this one on purpose. For my repairs I need at least one mainboard for every generation and I had no Soccer 370 mainboard so far. This one should support copper mine CPUs. I don't know about Tio Latin, but at least this board can handle FSB up to 133 MHz. All the caps are in good visual condition and Andreas was sure that this board is working. So it will be another great test board in my armory. The next one is a Matrox Parhelia graphics card. You don't see them that often to be honest, but unfortunately this one should be dead as far as I know. Well, the GPU fan completely stuck. I can't even rotate it with my fingers. I'm curious what happened there. I've been told that the card was over voltage and the voltage regulator burned. It was obviously replaced and some jumper wires were added, but it still doesn't work as far as I know. By the way, nice work with the jumper wires. Well, I will have to take a closer look at it later. Oh, very nice. And another Tsang ET4000 ISA graphics card. It misses the memory ICs, but I hope it is working. I already mentioned similar card in my last video. A fast and highly valued graphics adapter for the ISA bus. I'll just need to find some memory chips for it. And last but not least, something more modern. Maybe even too modern for my channel, but it is an ASUS P5LD2-X1333 mainboard, completely with the CPU and RAM. The CPU is a Core 2 Duo E7400, something what is still good, usable actually today in my opinion. You just need some Linux with a lightweight desktop environment and you are good to go. All the caps look also quite healthy. What kind of memory do we have here? Um, there are two DDR2 modules, 1 GB each. Makes 2 GB RAM in total. Well, to make the system really usable, I'd suggest to upgrade it to 4 GB of total memory. As I said, I'm really confident that this system is totally usable even today. It will definitely not make a gaming machine, but you have all you need for a usable PC. The PCI Express slot for a dedicated GPU, SATA controller for the SSD, 
And with 4GB of RAM and a lightweight operation system, this would make a really good machine for surfing and even with a better graphics card, you would even be able to play some 8 to 10 years old games on it, I guess. And this was the content of the box. A huge thank you to Andreas for this great donation. All that stuff will give me some nice ideas for the upcoming videos. Unfortunately, I cannot take a closer look at all of this now, but in this video I would like to take a look at least at this VLB graphics adapter. I've been told that it works, but the black and white color issue is very interesting and new to me, so I am very curious about it. Let's give it a try. I have here a mainboard which has a VLB slot. Let's plug it in and see what happens. One long, three short beeps. That sounds like a graphics card error. Wow, look at that, there is an image. Let me insert a compact flash card with DOS and try to boot into it. Well, did you see? The Energy Star logo, which should be yellow and green, is black and white indeed. And look at that, Volkov Commander is also black and white. This one should be actually blue. Let's start check it. Let's do some graphics tests. Yeah, that's funny. All the tests are working actually, but they are all monochrome indeed. What happens if I start a game? Wow, look at that, it is in color. Okay, really strange behavior. Andreas told me that this card came from some custom Siemens PC, and maybe its BIOS was optimized for a monochrome display? So let's try to change the BIOS and see if something will change. I already prepared an EEPROM here with another BIOS image, which I took from the vgamuseum.info, in the same way as I have shown it in my last video. So let's give it a try. Okay, at least we are getting the same video card error beeps. And nope, the Energy Star logo is still monochrome. And also in DOS there is no color, so I assume that the BIOS was not the culprit. So I chatted with Matt from DOS Reloaded DE about this issue, and he is an expert in questions about graphics cards from that time, and especially about S3 graphics chips. And this Spear V7 Mercury has an S3 chip under this blue sticker. Matt gave me an interesting hint that the S3 cards had a feature which most of the other cards didn't have back then. They had a monitor detection integrated into the RAM deck. I'm not sure about the reasons, but I think that it was probably for a better image quality or something. The RAM deck is this big IC on this card and it is responsible for digital to analog video signal conversion. And if it knows if the connected monitor is color or monochrome, it can set up the best possible values to improve the overall image quality on that monitor. So let's investigate in that direction. First of all, how does that work? Basically, the RAM deck measures the resistance on the RGB signal lines. Each of the RGB outputs are bound to the ground through a 75 ohm resistor. If the monitor is not connected, the full voltage level will be measured on this resistor and if monitor is connected, which will have more than 75 ohm resistance by VGA specification, the voltage on the resistor will drop and the RAM deck will know that there is a monitor connected. Here on top of the RAM deck we have couple of various capacitors and resistors. They all are used for the monitor detection and the datasheet for this RAM deck which is by the way AT&T 20C505, we can find all the needed information. 
This RAM deck is mostly the same as BT485A, so the datasheet is more or less similar. As I said, the resistors on the RGB pins must be 75 ohm each. And here they are. Let's check the values. Red, 75 ohm. Green, 75 ohm. Blue, 75 ish ohm as well. All three seem to be okay. In the datasheet, you can find a lot of information about the monitor detection, and I will not go into details now. One interesting point is, though, that this RAM deck has a pin named SANS, which outputs a 0 if a monitor was detected, or a 1 if not. Let's solder a wire to the pin and connect an oscilloscope to see what we get there. The sense signal should be 0 if a monitor was detected, or 1 if not. Let's see what we get. And as you see, we are getting a short 0 impulse, but otherwise the sense signal remains at 1, so the monitor was not detected. To be able to compare the voltages, the RAM deck gets its reference voltage built up upon some caps here. Let's measure them. Maybe the reference voltage is slightly off, so the internal comparator in the RAM deck is irritated. Here are some capacitor values from the datasheet which we are searching. And on this capacitor I measured 400 nanofarad, and this is in the board, so I have to remove it to get the real value, but it should be actually 100 nanofarad. So let's get it out of the board. Okay, here it is. Uh, it has 250 nanofarads. That is two and a half times more than it should be. Maybe that's enough to get to that arrow. Let's replace it. So, I soldered a new 100 nanofarad capacitor. Let's see if that changed anything. By the way, off camera, I tested the card with another mainboard, but the behavior was absolutely identical. And here you see this mainboard now. Wow, did you hear that? One normal beep, no post error anymore. And yay, I see a color image. Also in Check It, everything is in color now. What a great success! Well, not so fast. Here I am the next day. I left yesterday everything as it was and wanted to do some tests today and look what happens. The very same error beep codes and the screen is monochrome again. Everything back on start. What a shame. Well, my explanation? As I soldered the capacitor, I used hot air and I warmed up the PCB and the RAM deck. Unfortunately, I have some bad news, guys. Let me show you something. I will blow some hot air on the RAM deck. Nope, doesn't change anything yet. Let's warm up a bit more. It is now about 45 to 50 degrees Celsius. Let's give it another try. Yep, as you hear, no error beep codes and I can see a color image on the display again. Let's give it some minutes to cool down again and try to turn it on. And as you see, it doesn't work again. Off camera, I already checked all the solder joints on the RAM deck and around it. I reflew the solder and nothing helped. So, my conclusion is that the RAM deck is defective. It probably has a micro crack inside which gets closed when the card is uh, slightly warmed up and appears again when it is cooled down. I tested it already a couple of times and I can absolutely reliably reproduce it. 
That is really unfortunate. But I have also some good news. This defect seems to affect only the monitor detection circuits. Otherwise, this graphics card is working stable and fast. It is indeed a nice card, so what can we do about it? As you've seen, it worked in Doom in color and I didn't test it, but Andreas told me that it also works in Windows flawlessly. So there is a way to activate the color per software. And I'm glad to say that there is a DOS tool named S Monitor, which can be used to force color mode activation. It is actually made by Trident, but it seems to work for this S3 as well. As you see, it even says that the VGA board is currently configured for a monochrome monitor. So running S Monitor C for color, we can activate the color mode. And here we go, it is in color as it meant to be. As you see, everything works just fine. The S monitor command can be added to the auto exec bot, and this card would still make a solid work in a retro machine, even with slightly defective RAM deck, as you see. And this is it for me for today. Unfortunately, I cannot test now all the hardware I got donated, but I hope you still had some fun with this video. A huge thank you once again to Andreas at this point for his donation. As you see, it already gave us an interesting topic to check out. Please don't forget to like, dislike or comment this video. Every constructive feedback helps me to improve this channel. And for now, I say thank you and goodbye.